So it's uh, five o'clock the dot. So it's time for uh, the panel on policy supporting young people. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ruth Santos Bryan, and I'm delighted to uh, to be here to moderate this this panel. And obviously, as we have heard so far, uh, young people are amongst the, the most affected for the COVID-19 uh, crisis. For instance, you know, if we take employment, uh, the pandemic pushed uh, youth unemployment rates upwards in nearly all OECD countries, with an impact twice as strong as um, for the total population. And in unemployment losses among young people increase as well, the, um, well, translated into um, an increase in activity in 2020. Whilst there has been some progress uh, in those rates, they're still lagging behind other age groups. Uh, if we take also the share of young people not in employment, education and training, the NEET uh, rate has risen in many countries as in, still struggling to return to pre-crisis uh, pre levels. So for those young people in education, uh, leaving education, entering the labor market, inactive and employed, underemployed, the implications of the crisis could be long-term unless policy interventions are immediate, substantial and targeted so as to reach young people in Europe, particularly those who are um, most vulnerable during such severe economic downturns. So what is needed from a policy perspective to ensure that no young people is left, is left behind? And in order to answer that question, um, I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to be uh, joined by um, our uh, panelists. Um, and we'll start by introducing them before we kick off the discussions. Uh, very pleased to, um, to introduce um, Verli Miranda, a senior economist at the OECD. Uh, Antonio Ranieri, uh, head of the Department for Better Skills at Stedefop. Sebastian, uh, Sebastian Gonzalez had you. Um, administrator in charge of youth, social economy and education policies at the European Committee of the Regions, and also uh, contributions from our panelists, Professor Mihaila Randarenko uh, from the University of Belgrade, and uh, hopefully joined by uh, Jana Hainsworth, uh, General Secretary of Eurochild. So now we know um, each other, and I'm hoping that the ones that are not in the panel will still be active using the chat. Let's kick off the discussion with uh, Verle. So over to you uh, to um, kick start this panel. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. So I have uh, prepared a presentation. So let me um, share my screen with you. Uh, no, for me, it's, it's a real pleasure um, to be here uh, with you all today. And so um, I will present some evidence um, from OECD countries uh, on what we can do all uh, to get a better future for young, younger people. Um, because as we, uh, we've seen, of course, the, the past few years have been particularly harsh on young people, as Ruud already said. Um, so they have not only suffered from a spike in their employment, but they've also had financial housing difficulties, mental health issues, and many other uh, social and educational challenges. Now, um, policymakers already knew from the global financial crisis that a crisis can have uh, long-term consequences on young people's labor market and broader socioeconomic out outcomes, and this much more so than uh, for other generations. And so that's also the reason why uh, most OECD uh, governments actually uh, included a range of youth-specific measures uh, in the uh, youth on, in the uh, COVID uh, support packages that they introduced uh, from the very beginning of the crisis. And so this figure, which I've taken from a recent uh, policy brief um, written by us, shows that uh, 30 out of our uh, 38 uh, OECD member countries strengthened work-based learning um, initiatives. And um, 23 countries had hiring subsidies for young people in place. Now, what we've seen is that in more than half of these 23 countries that had these hiring subsidies in place, the number of young workers who benefited from such sub subsidies increased um, uh, during the pandemic. So if we compare uh, numbers from, two to, from 2019, October 2019 to October 21. So these measures seem to have really um, generated an increase 
um, in, in the number of, of young workers um, that have benefited from it. Now, uh, the figure also shows that 20 countries strengthened uh, employment services for young people. So they, they, um, they hired more staff, they focused on outreach, shop uh, support, but also, for example, training uh, for digital skills. Now, at the same time, we noticed that policy responses beyond labor market interventions um, have been much less comprehensive. So while over half of the OECD countries introduced some form of emergency income support, the measures very much uh, varied um, from in, in terms of scale and the reach. Uh, so it's especially students who are reliant on part-time work or for example, student shops to fund uh, their education and living costs. That's actually the group who has been most vulnerable during the crisis um, because one, their jobs disappeared but also because they could not always rely um, on unemployment benefits or other income support measures. Um, and uh, really depending on the country, some countries have introduced a lot of support for this group. On the other hand, France, a country that has done a lot for young people during the crisis, um, the actual support that the students got was very uh, limited. And so there was only, they could only receive like a one-off um, emergency uh, payment up to 500 euros during the entire crisis. So that's really minimal compared to um, the impact, of course, the pandemic had on young people. And the same we see for uh, mental health support. Um, about half of our member countries, OECD member countries, strengthened mental health support for young people, but often the increase in funding and availability of services has been uh, moderate and uh, to a large extent, unable to increase, uh, to match the increased demand. And so for, um, in, for, for the recovery, it's very important to uh, carefully evaluate all the uh, measures that have been introduced or expanded during the pandemic um, to make sure that we reach those young people who need it the most. And uh, also avoid that the subsidies go or subsidies or support go to young people who would otherwise have or by themselves been able to find a job. And so we definitely need uh, greater investments and more integrated uh, policy action uh, to tackle the more social and also mental health challenges. Now, um, we, uh, we have the OECD Risk That Matters survey um, that is uh, undertaken every two years. And it's a representative uh, cross-national survey uh, in uh, 25 OECD countries. And so that, um, that survey actually gives a very nice and very useful insights into young people's concerns, uh, perceived vulnerabilities and uh, policy uh, preferences. And so uh, from that survey, we learned that two in three 18 to 29 year old participants in that survey think that the government should be doing more or much more um, to ensure their economic and social security uh, and well-being. And so these shares range, of course, from across countries from, uh, for instance, 40% uh, in Denmark, where social protection is very well developed, to 93% uh, in Chile. And, uh, but even so, in all but five OECD countries, more than half of all young respondents believe that the government should be doing uh, much more. And so from that survey, we also learned that even in countries where job losses during the COVID crisis have been relatively low, like for example, uh, France and Germany, um, young people are worried. Um, and so uh, the OECD average there's 63% of young people um, uh, say that they're concerned about their household's finances and overall social and economic well-being. So that's nearly two in three uh, young people, which, which really shows how important it is to develop um, the right support uh, measures for young people. Now, we also um, have, a, have a question on whether um, they will, they're willing uh, to pay additional taxes to finance that uh, government's uh, additional government support. And there, of course, um, only one in four uh, respondents, aged 18 to 29, said that they would be willing to pay an additional 2% of their income in taxes or social contributions, for example, 
to benefit from employment or income support. So um, it also uh, calls on the government to be much more efficient uh, in organizing the services um, uh, that are needed. Um, at the same time, willingness to pay is actually much higher for getting better education uh, or uh, health support. So there, young people are uh, willing to pay additional taxes uh, for better support. Now, the survey also revealed that four out of 10 young people feel that the government does not always incorporate the views of young people. Um, and so that again is a call for involving um, young people much more into policy settings, which is also something that we have been working on uh, here at UACD um, to involve young people um, more frequently, to listen to them, to, to brainstorm with them, to talk to them, uh, when we um, uh, work on our policy recommendations for countries. Now, um, as our economies um, uh, are bouncing back from the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, um, youth employments have actually returned to their pre-crisis rates in many OECD countries. At the same time, we see that there is significant variation across countries. Um, and, the con and the recovery for young people continues to lag behind uh, of that for, uh, for older adults. And so um, we also call in our work that it's, it's very important not to lose sight of those young people who are most heavily affected by the crisis um, and for whom your support may not have been adequate so far. And so um, we call uh, really to focus on, for example, young people are who have just entered the labor market during the crisis because entering the labor market during crisis is, 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 is very, very difficult. Uh, students with insufficient financial means are also a group that have, has been um, neglected in some countries. And then finally, of course, young people experiencing poor mental health, which has of course become much more important um, during this crisis. And so our analysis has shown um, that governments, governments are not always reaching the young people who need it the most. Uh, for instance, um, in, 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 OECD, in EU countries, there is the youth guarantee initiatives. And, and despite all um, the, the importance it has and, and the, uh, the attention it's got gotten, and also the, the, the way they improve um, policy settings and support in EU countries, we see that barely 38% of needs, so these are the young people who are neither in employment nor in education or training, so 38% of the needs um, were registered with public employment services um, in 2019. That's very little. Um, among young people who are unemployed, um, this, the share is slightly higher, but it's still um, only 56%. Uh, so it means that um, public employment services are only reaching uh, about half of the unemployed youth uh, across uh, EU countries. So um, if we want to better, if we want to improve support for young people, it's very important to improve uh, outreach. And uh, to do that, we of course need to better understand who does not reach out for support and why, right? And so there can be a variety of reasons. For example, they, they're not entitled to income support, or um, they're not aware of the support they can receive, they lack trust in public authorities, et cetera. Or so it could also be that they just simply prefer to remain inactive. Um, and so all gaining that understanding will, will, will help us to better um, reach uh, these young people who really uh, would need support. And so the OECD, uh, we have been actively supporting our member countries in uh, their policy response uh, during the crisis. And so um, our updated OECD Youth Action Plan that was published last year is built around the five topics mentioned here. So it's really, it, it's kind of creating a whole of government approach, looking at education, labor market, social, um, social policy, but also young people's trust in government, uh, or, for example, uh, the administrative capacity to, to offer youth responsive services. And so uh, a key aspect, again, of this OECD Youth Action Plan is to involve young people and give them the opportunity to take action um, themselves. 
And so uh, we're now working across the house to deliver an uh, OECD uh, youth recommendation. And again, so the intention of this recommendation is to provide our countries with uh, very concrete, very comprehensive policy guidelines to set up a whole of government uh, support. And so it's a pity that the conference is a little bit too early because in, in on June 10, um, um, we, the, the recommendation will be adopted. Uh, so from then onwards, I can I can show you, show you all all the details. Uh, but for now, uh, um, yeah, we have to we have to wait wait a few more days. Um, and um, but yeah, so I think that was um, I, I know there's also time is running out. So that was the the end of my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for listening, and I very much look forward uh, to the discussion uh, today. I would be happy to answer. Uh, any questions uh, you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bella. I think it was very useful to um, highlight that, you, as you can see, the kind of the uh, young people's concerns, uh, but also the importance of um, creating that trust and in, in, in policy, but also in institutions. Uh, and the fact that one of the main challenges, as, as, you, as you mentioned, is not only to provide the right support, but actually for young people to access that support. Um, particularly for those who uh, are, you know, certainly uh, outside from, from, from the system. And, and, and also important that you highlighted that uh, looking at the life of young people, there are different potential organizations and policies that touch that life. And then this idea of the all encompassing approach. Um, so hopefully a lot of food for thought. So maybe I would like to invite um, the uh, discussants, um, Antonio and, and, and Sebastian, whether you, you want to, to come in and, and, and reflect on some of those points from, from your perspective. I, I think, Antonio, you, you seem ready. Yeah, so I'm ready. ready. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I mean, very interesting presentation, and I will try not to overlap and take a specific angle, because I mean, in the, it's clear that in, in the current Climate, economic climate or by uncertainty, as you know, uh, the question what should be done to support young people is crucial, especially for, for an organization like CEDEFOP um, that works at the interface between labor market and education and training. Uh, there are some facts that we know about young people in this context of the conference on population, etc. Uh, 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 the first uh, is that we have a shrinking population of young people. This is structural. Mm? If we consider the population aged 20, 29, more or less the same um, group that was also in the presentation, for instance, we had a drop of almost 15% in the last decade or so. So this was only partly compensated by an increase of young migrants from outside, but in any case, overall, we have lost more than 6 million people in this age group only, uh, which is comparatively small, as you can imagine. Uh, second, we know that uh, too many people still need education and training with low qualification. I have selected this 2029 because it's in this group that we can see the labor market outcomes of initial education and training, I mean, in, in the short term. And the gap, as you know, in terms of the employment rate of young people with low education as compared with, with their peers is really is still really impressive and increasing over time. And the real problem goes beyond this because when you consider also the, the how can I say the increase, the hidden early leavers, those who even if they get a, a diploma or a degree, don't have the expected level of skills and competence, so the problem would be even uh, bigger. Uh, third, we know that together with the low skilled, of course, young people are those, uh, as, as you said at the beginning, uh, who suffer the most from economic slowdown. More precisely, they are the most sensitive to economic change in general. Uh, at the moment, we don't expect a, a, a recession uh, in the next future. We still expect some improvements in the labor market under the assumption that we don't stop gas imports from Russia in any case. But I mean, growth in the European Union uh, is now lower than anticipated, inflation higher, and most of all, uh, consumers, businesses, 
expectations are likely to, to go down again. So now what is important to understand is why crisis hit the young people the most, because part of the answer is in the degree of flexibility in the labor market. Usually insiders are in a better position, new entrants to the labor market are the first to be penalized in times of crisis. However, a large part of the answer is in the gaps of skills and competencies. This may sound uh, paradoxical, and it is, uh, because if there is one strength of young people is the higher qualification compared to the older generations, but the thing is that getting a formal qualification, while essential, is not enough, especially in the eyes of, of employers. You know, as said, we been co collect in a systematic way millions of job vacancies across Europe to understand uh, uh, what employers want in terms of occupations and skills, depending on the occupation, uh, of course, academic knowledge, typical of the general education pathways, as well as technical and specialized skills, uh, typical of the vocational pathways are important. But unsurprisingly, as you can imagine, even in the case of highly specialized professions, the first thing employers ask for are like willingness to work in team, adaptability, interpersonal skills, and so forth. All things that are difficult to get if you don't have real experience. And young people usually lack precisely a work experience. Um, it's a long time, for a long time, I mean, for several years, CEDEFOP, not alone, of course, has been trying to direct the attention towards the need of building real systems of continuing and adult learning in our country. And you may wonder, what has this to do with young people? Well, if you think about it, uh, in light of what I just said, I mean, it's clear that the first to be penalized by the lack of a good adult learning system are precisely the young people. This is to say, to conclude, that uh, uh, talking about young people, we usually focus on the, on the formal initial educational training, and rightly so, because we need to improve its quality. We have to do all we can to further reduce uh, early leaving, but we also need to improve what young people will find just after leaving initial education and training. And, and we see this as a priority for most, I would say, of the European Union countries. Thank you, Antonio. And I think it's, it's obviously a very important point. And also, potentially, if we can pick up um, how then we also look at supporting young people in making the choices uh, and supporting those transitions and also looking at what are the sectors that could benefit um, from, um, yeah, from, from the, 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 the workforce. So maybe we'll be able to, to touch upon those, but let's, let's uh, give the floor to Sebastian um, with, with your reactions from, from this too. Um. Well, many thanks and uh, many thanks uh, to, to Mrs. Vell for the presentation and the very interesting overview. As uh, I represent here uh, the European Committee of the Regions, which is composed of uh, locally elected politicians, I was uh, thinking during your presentation what it would have looked like if we had integrated a regional perspective and see even more the, the inequalities that exist even within uh, the countries on the, on the issues uh, that you've raised. Now, on the guiding questions uh, that were those for this presentation uh, on how uh, youth policies could be uh, improved to, to, to increase uh, outreach, for instance. I think um, that, that all the, the, the topics that we're touching upon, like early intervention, increasing outreach, uh, also considering young people not as a homogeneous group, but also targeting vulnerable uh, groups within uh, young people are very interesting and from uh, an important and from our point of view uh, this is a positive perspective that the European Union has taken uh, and as you mentioned the, the European Youth Guarantee in your presentation uh, you, you can clearly see from the reinforced uh, Youth Guarantee from the Council recommendation on the reinforced Youth Guarantee that this aspect has been uh, have been clearly uh, taken into account uh, and that recommendations have been given on how to improve the, the outreach of young people, how to uh, how to 
to, to, to take a step, further steps in early interventions. So uh, all this is, is, is crucial and youth unemployment is really one of the priorities of the CR. So uh, on another topic uh, which uh, shortly touched upon, uh, which was youth engagement and participation in democracy. This is for us a very interesting topic, uh, especially now in the context of the European Year of Youth. And uh, for us, it, it's a very a complex challenge um, with many factors that are not easily to, to, to isolate um, with macro factors like globalization, uh, digitalization and, and many important transitions that we're living through that have an impact on, on democracy itself, but also on institutional frameworks and education and other issues that affect uh, especially uh, youth participation uh, as a subcategory of the population. Uh, we uh, have taken the approach at the CUR to, um, to launch an initiative, a consultative initiative with hundreds of young people uh, to propose new recommendations on how to improve uh, youth participation in formal politics, especially. And uh, we hope to, to come with the conclusions uh, by the end of this year as, as, our, as our main legacy for the European Year of Youth. So with that, I conclude and I, I thank you all um, for, for your invitation and, and Miranda Verel for your presentation. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sebastian. Uh, very important issues as well, and, and a very important one to to end off with uh, with um, you know young people's voices and how that can be um, um, kind of be included in in decision making. Uh, I'm I'm very also keen to to hear, obviously from our panelists, but also the people uh, listening in and having um, maybe posting some questions for our speakers. So please feel free. Um, to use the chat for that, but maybe just obviously um, continue with um, with the inputs from from our panelists. Um, I, I, maybe uh, if I can put you on the spot, Jana, um, colleague from from Eurochild, uh, maybe you would like to um, to come in and and and, and bring your perspective. Uh, you know, when a very younger generation, isn't it? Uh, that is is also our future. So, Jana. Yes, thanks. Thanks very much, Ruth. Um, and I, I'm representing Eurochild, a European umbrella network of organisations working with and for children and predominantly um, focusing on the urgency of addressing inequality and poverty in childhood. Um, and as I said earlier in the panel, I think that sort of recognition of children as individuals rights holders from the moment of birth and the agency that they have on their lives and enabling them to participate fully and be um, influence the decisions that affect them is is for us a very much foundational piece of, of building inclusive democracies um, we would definitely want to prioritize investments in addressing inequality and poverty in early childhood um, looking not only at early childhood education and care, so formal care settings for, for children, but also thinking about the whole spectrum of services and supports that can enable families in the most vulnerable situations to provide the most nurturing and care environment for, for young children. Um, I think, Antonio, you talked about the um, career paths and the, the employability of young people being so um, rested on adaptability, social skills, communication, these all of these what we essentially refer to as soft skills, but are perhaps the hardest um, and the most important in, in today's society. And they are fundamentally built um, in childhood and their, their experiences and their interaction with the, the supporting adults around them from earliest childhood on. Um, we uh, have been very supportive of the European Union adopting the European Child Guarantee Initiative last year. Um, we are concerned about how seriously the EU member states are taking its implementation. Um, they are required to develop national action plans, which will really um, outline how the most vulnerable communities and groups of children, those with disabilities from migrant background, um, Roma, children in living in precarious family situations can access the most basic of services. And it is 
if if it if we manage to um, lock that vision into the government mindset and and allocate necessary resources to it, it has the potential we believe to be transformative, not just for the children that are going to be accessing and able to realize their potential through these services, but through for, for society as a whole, as it's building inclusive um, societies, and it's, it's, it's enabling children to fulfill their potential and be open um, and, and, and make their own choices according to who they are and individuals, what their purpose is in life, their assets, their skill set, etc. Um, so, there, there is potential, of course, with the new, war in Ukraine and the pressure and the numbers of children also arriving with the child protection crisis that that's invoking. Um, we, we're, we're very, very concerned about the situation of children, but we also do see a political momentum to recognise that investing in children has to be a core priority of building better societies in the future. And I think that's a very important point, obviously, as, as you mentioned, and um, vulnerability stems from uh, many complex factors and compound over time, isn't it? So the reality of investing early on um, will, will bring those, those benefits. And actually, uh, if you look at the youth guarantee as an example of another guarantee and, and, and the emphasis that now is being put on outreach and the need that for people to reach the services, the young people, uh, an important argument to put the, that emphasis as well when it comes to the uh, children uh, guarantee. So very, very important questions. And, and now, you know, just closing the circle, we're going to uh, Mikhail um, and, and get your views as well and very important points that our panelists and discussants have highlighted. Uh, sure. Uh, well, I have been thinking uh, how to uh basically arrange uh, my my intervention and somehow i would like to to get back to the to the start to the recent uh, experience of um, of covid and how it affected uh, uh, young people and uh, and what have we learned from uh, from it and what could be perhaps used and uh, but then of course within a sort of much more general thinking of uh, on, on the, let's say, architecture of uh, policies supporting supporting young people in these uncertain times. Uh, and I will start with, uh, interestingly, with the Serbian experience, which is, uh, which is quite a typical for a sort of uh, country which is not, uh, not really rich and uh, which has been uh, influenced by the sort of strict targeting philosophy of the international financial organizations for, for some time. Instead, this time, uh, our government actually delivered a, a series of more or less universal interventions to firms, individuals, and more recently towards some categories, including uh, in a sort of symbolical, symbolical way, and some would say even you know, perhaps uh, related to political cycle, but in any case, a sort of uh, flat um, uh, flat uh, amounts given to every citizen first during the during the COVID COVID crisis, and then uh, uh, now uh, there there are like two uh, sets of. Uh, of, of uh, be cash benefits uh, to every youth between 18 and 30, uh, 30 years of age. And uh, uh, of course, there is a criticism, uh, but th there are also some voices uh, supporting this. And actually, I would support this in a, uh, uh, for, a, let's say, from a uh, partly philosophical standpoint, if you like, from the sort of rights uh, uh, approach uh, and from that universalism that I think uh, is as important as targeting. Uh, and uh, why, why would that, uni what would actually this uh, universalism entail? That's something that uh, in most countries of um, uh, Western Europe, one can 
see as given, for example, universal or near universal child benefits. But in some parts of, uh, of uh, Europe, actually, they're being either phased out or actually not, uh, uh, not applied. Then there are uh, some other sort of important uh, equalizing mechanism that uh, have been proposed for quite some time, but uh, have never implemented in practice, perhaps as only as, uh, as experiments, uh, not on a large scale. For example, uh, the, the universal grant for adulthood for young people has been proposed by Tony Atkinson and then later many, many others. Uh, and uh, that's something that I think would uh, uh, be important, not only as a sort of uh, creating equality of opportunity at, at one pivotal moment, for example, at the age of 20 or 25, but uh, together with the child benefit, uh, which is important uh, for a young person uh, when it is a child, and uh, then when uh, they are young, young parents, of course. Uh, so these would uh, send a message of uh, security, uh, of a sort of universal support that somehow would disproportionately, and that's the experience from Serbia, disproportionately uh, be important to those who are the most vulnerable. So in a way, it is a sort of sophisticated targeting. If everybody gets the same amount, then that's a sort of quite a progressive. That's what we often, uh, often forget. The, uh, quite a, pro 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 a progressive transfer. In that way, uh, I think that uh, somehow uh, thinking in terms of, and I, I know that I'm a little bit too general, but thinking in terms of interventions toward youth that are both targeted and, and universal would, uh, uh, you know, would be a useful guidance for those who create concrete policies. Uh, at, at this moment in, in history, if you like. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. I um, don't know if are any reactions to uh, that, um, you know, suggestions or even from uh, the wider audience. Oh, Bele? Yes. Um... Thank you. Thank you all uh, speakers, of course, for the, uh, the very interesting, interesting remarks. Um, so I, I, I wanted to react to, to a few and maybe starting with the last uh, comments from Mikhail, uh, because of course he was raising uh, some interesting uh, elements on, on like universal benefits and universal grants uh, for adulthood. And in that sense, the crisis has been a bit of a nice um, trial, right? Because the, during the crisis, the most important one, uh, aspect was trying to uh, support as many young people as possible. And um, it was better to tar to support a, a few more rather than a, uh, too, too few. Um, and, and so in, in that sense, many uh, of, uh, of the EU countries have really been um, uh, very generous and sometimes made it very easy to access, access support. For example, in Germany, uh, you could basically uh, access support if you showed that your bank account was empty, which was a very easy way uh, for you to access support, where in other countries, um, if you would look at the normal unemployment benefits uh, or income support uh, benefits, you, you have to fulfill so many conditions that often young people would not fulfill these conditions. And so, um, uh, countries really tried to support as many young people who needed support. Um, and of course, um, maybe uh, made it too easy, uh, but at least it, it really supported, I mean, it helped to reach as many young people as possible, right? And so in that sense, crisis, uh, and that referring back to, to Jana's common crisis, is also a good moment to create political momentum, right? That, that can really change things um, that, um, are otherwise impossible to change. And I think um, 
for example, uh, looking at the previous global financial crisis, the very good thing that came out of it was, of course, the youth guarantee. Uh, it took way too long. <laughs> um, it took really um, a couple of years before countries realized, well, actually, young people's outcomes are not improving. We really have to do something. Um, and, and we really see the results of that political momentum and the political action that that, that it, it generated. And, and, and if we now look at the impact of the crisis, yes, the impact was huge on young people. Um, but for most countries and for most young people, um, the situation is back to normal. Um, and so now the focus should really be on those who remain vulnerable, who had, um, uh, who still have uh, impact and who may actually have long-term consequences of the crisis. Um, and so, uh, so that's, that, that we believe is really um, at this stage, the way forward. Um, and, uh, and, and um, yeah, so I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm speaking too long. Maybe I should give the floor to the other speakers so that I think um, the, the political momentum and really the, the, the measures, I think it's the fact that they have worked is really very encouraging. Uh, and um, um, it, it's very important to, to continue um, improving policies further. Um, yes, Jan, maybe I'll let you speak now. Anna, go ahead. So we would be very, very supportive of the principle of universal access and ensuring that then that universal access is topped up and enforced to support, to reach and to make sure the services are accessible to the most vulnerable. And what that requires is really um, intense investment in kind of the, the, those basic services, which is why we were so um, supportive of the initiative of the child guarantee with those um, essential services and how then they can be made accessible to the most vulnerable and what outreach um, is going to be um, in made, but, but with insisting that it's built on a, a structural system that guarantees free effective access to all children and all families of those basic services, which are considered to be the foundation on which you can um, realize your potential and, and get the support to live, um, uh, have basic needs and, and the basic requirements met. Um, and such a an approach, I think, is very much um, endorsed and embedded at a political level. Then the question is, how do you how do you can make that a reality? And, and given the differentials between the capacities of the system, even within the European Union, relatively rich, but the differentials are huge. And what do you prioritize? And how do you make sure? That actually the most vulnerable communities are front and center of, of, of your success. So because what has happened, and I think um, I don't know the implementation of the youth guarantee in so much detail, but anecdotally one hears that you tend to cream off those young people who are just at the edge of getting jobs or entering back into vocational training and, you, and you're not able to reach the, mo the ones who are, who are furthest away and I think it's the same in, in this in um, with respect to um, to children and particularly young children. If we think about Roma communities, we think of undocumented migrants. We think of those who are really um, unable to to access services. And if we put their needs and at, at the front, then I, I think it it really challenges us not to or to to make sure that yes, we have a, a, a universal um, principle, but the most important part is thinking how do the most vulnerable um, communities reach those services and how are they made um, yeah made accessible I think I managed to unmute myself now uh, in that sense Jenna I think uh, an important aspect is it's is how to reach out, and 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 that's one of the, the challenges that, for instance, the in the Youth Guarantee, how you work with the right organisations that allow for that reaching out uh, and 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 that collaboration across 
different organizations that had a different sphere of influence and, and support in providing the services. Um, and I think that's, that's an important point. Sebastian? Yes, so on the, on the universal principle, uh, another aspect that I think is, is interesting is that those uh, social policies that are universal are those that are the most popular, uh, the less contested uh, and the more uh, yeah, durable. Uh, when we were talking about also, um, Jana, about the differentials between even member states uh, in the EU, I think it's, it's also, again, I'm sorry to, to repeat myself, but to integrate also the idea of the differentials in, in the regional uh, level. And when we mentioned the, the child guarantee, uh, a lot of the, of the actual work of providing these services, that these basic services that we're talking through the, the child guarantee, it is done at the regional and local level when we talk about uh, access to, to education, to housing, to, to, to health, or, or many other issues. The, 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 the local and regional level play a, a huge role. And the COR has actually uh, produced a study uh, on the local implementation of the child guarantee, uh, which shows the tremendous burden uh, it is uh, for a local and regional level, which it don't, don't always have the means, and the important role as well that the EU plays in uh, providing uh, substantial aid uh, to, to the local and regional level um, in this aspect. Uh, regarding how to outreach, because now it is something that is clear that uh, the EU is uh, promoting outreach, uh, but how? What is the effective way? Uh, there are some proposals in the, in the youth guarantee that are really broad. Um, now, I think the, the, this touches upon another aspect that maybe we, we haven't emphasized enough is the production of data, the production of knowledge on what works and what doesn't. And uh, on this, we also have uh, a lot of work to do also, uh, again, at the, at the regional and local level. Thank you, Sebastian. From, uh reminding us about the, the, the um, you know, well, you might design some policies at, you know, national level is the implementation is where it is closest to the citizen. Uh, and that's important aspect of enabling the local and regional level to actually deliver those um, services and support, um, a, a very important uh, aspect on, on that. Um, looking if there are any other, um, Know, uh, reactions to, to some of these points. Um, yeah, maybe if you want, Ruth, uh, also to support Sebastian, not to leave him alone with the, 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 the point of the regional, which is very, very important. Before, Ruth, you asked me, okay, maybe you can tell us about uh, the future in terms of sectors and things like that. And, uh, you know, uh, the first thing is, uh, as we know, we have a level of uncertainty, but not only today, I mean, it's uh, in, in the last decade, I mean, we had many experience, a lot of uncertainty. I can tell you that the work of forecasters has become very, very difficult. And, uh, um, but I mean, it's not only this, it's also the point that uh, the general forecast uh, type of uh, foresight approach can be useful in general terms for policymakers. But then we know that the actual labor market is highly segmented, and this is the point of Sebastian. So the actual real labor markets, um, I mean, 90% of what happens in the labor market happens at the local and regional level, <clears throat> and is there where it's a mix of uh, trends and also vision about uh, uh, the future development of a certain territory. So it's not only something that you predict, it's also something that you build with your policies. So it's very difficult to say in general what, uh, what is uh, necessary. And this is related to another point that maybe the COVID helped somehow to, to realize um, not only the importance of public policy, but also the need to embrace the, the complexity that today public policies in general uh, requires, and especially when it comes to, for example, to education and training. For instance, now we are discussing about young people, but we know that, for example, for statistics, young people goes from 15 to 35 years old. But we know that 
uh, within this range, I mean, we have things completely different uh, things because people uh, in development in very different conditions, very different characteristics, needs, aspirations, and, and so forth. And uh, uh, this is why, for example, before I try to focus on, on this segment of the 20, 30 years old, which I think is crucial from a certain point of view for the discussion about what we can do to intervene. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and even in this case, the, the complexity is that, I mean, within this age group, we have again, uh, different profiles and needs. And it's not possible to approach these people with the same instruments, with the same approach of policy. Uh, within this group, we have those who are seeking for a work or for education and training, and those who are not uh, seeking. And in the first group, there are those who are just starting to seek for a job, those who have done this already for some time, those have, who have been trying to find a job for a long period. And these people require different type of uh, support. And then when we consider people outside of the labor force, we have those unavailable due to family responsibility or because illness or disability, those who are totally discouraged and given up uh, searching for work or further learning. So and again, we need different type of approaches. And so it's not easy to accept this complexity, which requires to identify the different targets, design different approaches, and, and um, from this point of view, maybe as was said before by the colleague, I mean, some help can come from looking at examples of successful intervention, uh, addressing the different uh, profiles. Yeah, and I think probably adding to that as well, um, Antonio, uh, we have different profiles, but also people that have different problems and, and complex needs. And for some of them, potentially finding a job is not the, the, the main priority, they might need to just a place to stay and, and other things. So is that kind of how those, I think an important aspect of um, how you address those needs. And, and I'm probably going back to Berle because I think in talking about policies, we also need to talk about how you coordinate certain interventions, particularly when these interventions are coming from different ministries, from different um, you know, departments, um, and 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 we we understand that obviously the support cannot just be looking at education, looking at employment, but how that all come together. So maybe I, I would like to. I mean, I, I know it's something that has been discussed for a long time, but is is this idea of that coordinated um, coordinated approach, and also considering that beyond education, employment, there are many other things that affect the life of the young person, and it's how that can be. Uh, brought together and what are kind of the kind of examples of, of those successful uh, policies that go beyond that a bit of a silo approach uh, but maybe i'm putting too much into the question but i'm elaborating too much the question i don't want to guide you in your response um so Bella, maybe you want to to uh, reflect on that yes no no absolutely that's that's fine Ruth. well actually i i would say that 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 your question is basically what we have been working on over the past decade. Uh, so um, if, if you look at our investing in youth reviews, so those are country reviews where we um, have really looked at how different policies, different sectors, different actors uh, work together or do not work together um, and, and what can be done to improve such a collaboration. Um, so, um, we, we, we really looked at, at the whole picture, right? Um, starting with the education sector um, and, and looking at, at what the education sector can do in collaboration with uh, employers, in collaboration with um, um, the public employment service, in collaboration with, uh, for example, mental health services uh, to really provide uh, a more uh, integrated support, coordinated support uh, for young people. First of all, some general universal services from which all young people can, can benefit, but then also some more targeted uh, services and support measures for those who really 
uh, needed. Um, and then again, like the transition to the labor market, which are the different actors that could play a role here? What do we need to avoid that we lose track of young people who drop out of school? In some countries, like in Sweden, there is this, um, it's the municipality's obligation to know where each young person is. So it's not the school. So if the young person drops out of school, they inform the municipality, but then it's a municipality who needs to go and check where are they? Have they moved maybe uh, to a different school or maybe even to a different municipality? So there's a whole tracking system to make sure that we know where these young people are and that we can uh, then set up with the right support system. Um, and um, so, so, so it, it very much uh, requires a collaborative uh, action. And, and you've mentioned, I mean, outreach has been mentioned quite a lot. And so um, um, a few years ago, we, we worked uh, with the Slovenian government uh, to see, um, because they wanted to bring down their need rate. It was already pretty low, but it was, it was just not going down. And we were really wondering what was happening uh, until they realized that they're actually not reaching many of those young people they wanted to support. And so, um, so we, we, we looked at how they could uh, set up kind of an outreach system where the public employment service, first of all, took the responsibility of, um, it was their role also they, uh, that they wanted the mandate to, to go um, and look for those young people. But of course, they, they do not necessarily have um, the, the possibility or they even know where these young people are. So for that to work, they need to collaborate with local actors, local uh, youth association, youth workers, um, youth ambassadors, uh, with, as, as they call it in some countries, um, to go and talk and find young people on the street or in youth clubs and start talking to them and, and trying to better understand what are their challenges and, and what they need and what kind of services um, they would need. And then, and then of course, you, I mean, you have the well-known example of the Oyamos in Finland, where they have this integrated service provision. It, it, it very much differs across regions, again, even within Finland. Uh, but there's some very nice examples of, of very well integrated support services where young people do not only um, receive employment support, but also even support on how to apply for income support benefits or uh, mental health, uh, psychological support, etc. Um, but I think the red line through all of our work is really looking at how do we connect the different policies and make sure that they work together, that the different actors can work better together, the different in the transition points that young people, because young people, of course, go through a lot of transition points. And it's basically at those transition points that many, many things can go wrong. Um, and that's when we tend to lose them. And that's where we, we need to do better um, to, to prove uh, the work. Um, and, and, um, and so, uh, Again, I think because, of course, we're talking a lot about young people, um, but uh, throughout, uh, so, so especially the last year, we have been organizing youth consultation, trying, uh, really listening to them. And, and what they stress really is important, as also Jana mentioned it before, like it's the, the agency, right? They want to have a say uh, in, in, uh, in what support they need. They, they want to to sit at the table together with policymakers, um, and and they want to really be be listened to, and I think that that is really something crucial, right? We're not just talking about support to them, but how do we give them the opportunity uh, to uh, improve their own situation? Um, so I think that that's uh, that is something that um, I think we should be paying much more attention to, uh, and also just for us because we have been going through this process of developing a youth recommendation. And um, I must say that our consultations with young people have uh, very much influenced our understanding. Uh, and, and even in, in some parts fundamentally changed our, our, um, our views on those things. So, so that's something that, that is really, I would really encourage everybody um, to, to really take that, that aspect of youth consultation very seriously. And, uh, and that's a perfect point uh, to end uh, this panel, is the idea that uh, you support uh, young people, but with the young people. 
um, and, and enabling them to, to make those choices about their own kind of solutions. And I think it's, it's a very, very important aspect. So we touch upon many things. Uh, uh, the crux, as we said, is providing the right interventions, but uh, for, for those to be able to reach, uh, to, to, to reach the, 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 the right uh, people and those who, who need it the most. We talk about obviously the, the important elements of the implementation at all levels and, and many other different topics that I think it will take me another half an hour to, um, to highlight. Uh, but again, um, uh, how important it is to, to look at those issues um, in, in a coordinated way. Um, and and I'm, I'm very grateful, obviously, for all the reflections from this fantastic panel. Um, and I hope that um, you know your 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 uh, learning and experience reinforces some of the messages, and ultimately we create that uh, the right policies to support the next generation. Um, so thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of the day, um, and um, hope that you you enjoy the Berlin Demography Days. Thank you.